Welcome to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. We introduce you to the voices of community thought leaders and change makers who are working on solutions that face our fellow individual community members, neighborhoods, cities, and our region. This is George Coster, your host. This episode is part of our series exploring COVID-19's impact on nonprofits and small businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area. Back in April of 2020, when we decided to create this ongoing series on COVID-19's impact, first on nonprofits and then on small businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area, we, like you, had no idea how long the pandemic would go on and what the health and economic impact would be in our community. With vaccinations increasing, COVID-19 cases and deaths decreasing, we're now moving into the summer of 2021 with the reopening of the economy and all of the uncertainty of our ever-changing indoor and outdoor vaccinated and unvaccinated protocols and the politics that will drive how we all come back together as a unified or fractured community. We will continue to shine a spotlight on the nonprofits and small businesses that make up the fabric of our community along with the founders and staff who are struggling to deal with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their operations, services, and sustainability until we can all get to the other side of the pandemic. Along the way, we will also share with you all the amazing solutions that our nonprofits, small businesses, foundations, and government leaders are working on to help us all get to the other side of the pandemic and come together to rebuild our communities with more economic, social, and environmental equality. So we continue to see that the shelter system has been impacted by reducing capacity. And so we really need to keep that in mind as we come into this next phase, right? So we added the Family Stability Program to make sure that we're supporting families in remaining housed. Right. So that's really important for the families that have been impacted by losing their employment, their income. And with this, our focus within our services also switched to supporting them in applying for unemployment benefits, tax relief funds. So really, the services that we provided changed in that way. This is the director of family services of Raphael House. With over 15 months into the pandemic, our most vulnerable families are continuing to face housing problems and securing support services. The city of San Francisco has extended the rent moratorium for another 60 days to the end of August, but the end of the state of California's rent moratorium ending June 30th. With the potential of more families becoming homeless, we wanted to bring you the voices of Raphael House to share their work on being the bridge out of homelessness and poverty for families over these past 50 years. I'm joined remotely by Ceci Ferber, the Director of Family Services, and Mark Slater, the Executive Director of Raphael House. So thanks for being here, Ceci and Mark. Thank you, George, for having us here today. We really look forward to speaking to you more about Raphael House. Well, I'd like to turn to you, Mark, to have you provide a little history to our audience about Raphael House. I consider it to be one of the really wonderful legacy social nonprofits here in San Francisco that's been doing an amazing job of helping families, specifically single-headed households in San Francisco for decades. Well, thank you. I mean, the story of Raphael House is actually a very unique one. Actually, starting this month, it's our 50th birthday. We've been around for 50 years as an organization. And when we started out in 1971, the, really the focus of the organization was to ensure that when families were experiencing homelessness and they were seeking shelter, that they're able to stay together while in shelter. And that seems like such a simple idea today. But back in 1971, if a single parent, if a mother with a single child needed to go somewhere, they would go to a single person's shelter. And if a family found themselves experiencing homelessness, typically one of the parents would stay with the kid, usually the mother, and the father would go to a single men's shelter. Or if it was a same-sex couple, they would actually get split up and be in completely separate shelters as well, too. So when we were basically founded in 1971, the idea was to keep families together in shelter while they're experiencing homelessness and ensure the fact that when they were there, they had a chance to even increase and develop the family bond. And that was one of the main focuses when we started out in Raphael House. Years went by as we started to develop our model. And really what came out of that was what we call our holistic model of support. And it was the idea that when families come into Raphael House, we see them as individuals. We make sure that any challenges or roadblocks that they have within their own personal lives and the professional lives as well too, we have a chance to sit down and really try to see how they're doing, what they need and what they want to achieve. And what really kind of grew out of that was the idea that by treating each person as an individual, 
We started to develop education programs around children, workforce developments around the parents, family wellness programs really around the individuals and the family itself, and really started looking at ways with, through our case management that we could start really empowering individuals and families to really look beyond shelter look towards the future and really see what they wanted to achieve. And I think what made this so unique initially was we often would ask our families, where do you see yourself after shelter? Where do you want to be? What do you want to achieve? We weren't telling them what to do. We're asking them these very important questions. And from that really stemmed a relationship that grew into a model that even after families left Raphael House, we developed something called the Bridge Program. The families were able to get the same supportive measures they had within shelter when they left Raphael House. So over time, our organization has always continually evolved. We continually evolved with the needs of our families, obviously being the only privately funded and privately supported organization, especially homeless shelter in San Francisco, has allowed us to be nimble to be open and to really meet the needs of our families during that time. And Ceci really can kind of give you more details about our program, but is that unique relationship that we have in our case management and that seeing everyone as an individual and treating with dignity and respect while they're at Raphael House and beyond, that really ensures the fact that they feel supported and that they find themselves hopefully out of homelessness. Thank you. It's a good overview. And Ceci, could you dive a little bit deeper into each of the programs? Yes, absolutely. So within the residential shelter program and the bridge program, we do offer four main services. And these are children's services, family wellness, case management, career development services. So Mark already shared a little bit about them. But I did want to add here that we serve around 60 families within the residential shelter program and around 200 families within the aftercare support, which we call the bridge program. Children's services, we offer tutoring support to our children and teens. We also offer support for any costs related to summer camps or any extracurricular activities, external tutoring for any academic goals that our children have. And also we offer any events such as birthday parties or any giveaway or holiday event, which right now those are on hold, but we did make sure to provide some version of that during the pandemic. So by appointment only, we are able to support families with these needs. Family wellness, we offer support sessions that are non-clinical for families. We also provide parenting support, child care resources, and referrals for clinical services if that's needed. Case management, we support families with their housing goals. This sometimes means that we're partnering with housing navigators for rental subsidies or supporting the families in completing housing applications, which are so important during this time. And lastly, within career development services, we offer any opportunities for seeking employment, increasing the family's income, and also support with any financial literacy resources or enrolling in educational vocational programs. So again, these are just a few items that we support with families during this time and also under each program. So much of what you do obviously is in person, right? You're there in person and they're in your facilities. How has COVID-19 impacted the operations and what has the team done to pivot everyone's favorite word these days to address these issues? Yeah, I mean, really, I think the biggest challenge has been shelter capacity. I mean, our facility, we're currently, and we have been from, for pretty much most of our time as Raphael House, on a facility that's on Sutter and Larkin Street. And it was an old, I believe it was the Golden Gate Hospital, developed in 1907. So the building's a much older building. It's really conducive to our programs when it comes to the idea of group gatherings. You know, there's group gathering spaces, like we have a wonderful teen room, we have a tutoring room, we have a computer club, we have a workforce development office, essentially a separate building, a beautiful children's library, a main library, a children's reading garden, a rooftop garden, a children's play area on the roof, and a beautiful solarium for a lot of our programs. But even our dining room itself is also based on this idea that everyone has a table and you gather in a large group, even though you have your own separate table, and, and you dine together. So everything was kind of built around the social aspect. And when obviously COVID hit, we as an organization, I kind of remember the first couple of weeks, I sat down during our senior team meeting in the library and looked at each other and said, I think this is the last time that we're going to meet in person. And a lot of my friends and a lot of people I know work within the medical industry. And what they're talking initially about COVID was really that this is something that they weren't seeing it was going to happen just for a couple of weeks, like it was being expressed initially. This is something that really could be have a long lasting effect on just our ability to, to gather and really how we conduct ourselves socially. So 
we as a senior team right away had to make an assessment looking at our building and thinking, well, what can we do pretty much to serve as many families as possible while making sure that families are safe and staff is safe and also ensuring that we were really adhering to the Department of Public Health guidelines. So initially we were serving 20 to 25 families within our facility. We really had to reduce our capacity down to 12. We had to look at our meal program and really have start doing step meals, making sure that there's social distancing in our dining room, we really have to change the nature of our programs. We have a lot of, again, group meetings a lot of FaceTime, case management meetings are one-on-one, family wellness meetings are one-on-one. How can we bring that online? And of course, like what we're doing now, or still doing, is turning to Zoom, turning to Google Meetups, turning to technology initially was what we started to do internally within the organization. And then really started working with our families in our bridge program and the aftercare program to really see how we can kind of bring those resources to our families remotely. And I will say there was a lot of challenges initially because not everyone had a laptop, not everybody had a computer, not everybody had an internet connection. The digital divide is real. So we really started working with some of our community partners, of course, being privately funded, some of our grantors, and we're able to have these conversations because they're very flexible to change some of the funding we had over that time to help our families overcome the digital divide, start working towards more education initiatives with kids having to go to school, obviously via Zoom, and really working within our own shelter to make sure that the families had access to the technology that they needed to engage in our program. So those first quarter, really the first few months of COVID was us kind of reimagining our program and really seeing how we could serve our families more effectively. But initially capacity and still is actually today is one of the largest issues because just the nature of our facility. And we can't change that. Just to follow up on that, Mark, here we are June 8th, about a week away from the magical wand of California reopening on the 15th of June. And you're within the city and county of San Francisco with all of their health requirements. What do you and the organization see in the way of it being able to expand back out to provide your wonderful services to more than 12 families? Well, really, and Ceci will talk a bit more about the program details, but the one thing that was very unique was that even though COVID was happening, Ceci will probably go into this more in detail, we did have families actually were able to successfully exit shelter and find housing during COVID, which is also very surprising. And also due to really the work of the staff and um, really the partnerships with the families as well too. We were also able to conduct intakes as well, obviously to stay within that standard of about 12. But I think one of the greatest areas that we had a chance to really expand was really looking at how we can kind of really enrich those grid services to more families within our program. Program. And what came out of that as well, too, this new idea that we've been kind of working on for a few years was our family stability program. The idea is if we're limited with the number of families we can serve in shelter currently, of course, based upon the Department of Public Health guidelines, where are some other areas that we can have a really significant impact during COVID and ensure that we increase our ability to support families and ensure that families are currently in our bridge program, do not fall back into homelessness and have the resources that they need to remain stable. And really the work that Ceci and our staff have done with the Family Stability Program was so important. And I'll let her talk a little bit more about that. But really the key component was what we've learned from taking our programs virtually online, including our tutoring program, workforce development, and even having access to other aspects of our programs. We learned that you were helping our families in the bridge program get access to resources without having to travel back into Raphael House, without having spending time, money, and resources to come meet us for certain needs. So we really found some efficiencies to really expand our program because of access to digital technology that our families now have. And and a big part of that was the Family Stability Program. So Ceci, if you want to talk a little bit more about the Family Stability Program, that'd be great. I did want to share that we still want to make sure that we follow health and safety protocols because though we may be coming to a point where there may be restrictions lifted, it is still very important for our Raphael House team to follow health and safety protocols as per DPH's guidance. So we really do follow their lead. And I also wanted to add that the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing has been really instrumental in leading this conversation on a weekly basis. Rafael House attends weekly provider calls in which we participate here of any information that we can share with our community and also just to understand what other shelters are doing. So we continue to see that the shelter system has been impacted by reducing capacity. And so we really need to keep that in mind as we come into this next phase, right? So with having said that, Mark explained, we add 
added the family stability program to make sure that we're supporting families in remaining housed, right? So that's really important for the families that have been impacted by losing their employment, their income. And with this, our focus within our services also switched to supporting them in applying for unemployment benefits, tax relief funds. So really the services that we provided changed in that way. And our family stability program has been able to continue to support families with any financial needs that came up during this time. So again, paying for rent, paying for utility bills, childcare. So all of these things that were impacted, our program has been able to come in and support our families during this time, but also with our amazing community and donors who have been seeing that this is a need. So that's really where we were able to come in and support our families. And Ceci, staying with you, and this is the same question for Mark as well, over both of your time spent at Raphael House, what do you feel has been the biggest impact to families in San Francisco? And could you share a personal story? Yeah. So the Family Stability Program, we shared a little bit about that in terms of the impact. And again, supporting families with financial resources during this time has been critical and making sure that they're maintaining their housing and also getting out of homelessness. So this is why we partner really closely with our community and make sure that our families have all the resources that they need to get out of homelessness. So a story that I do like to share, and again, this is just a really hard to pick because our families have so many amazing journeys and successes. So I like to share a Gaudi story and I do have permission to share her name. So Gaudi is a mother of three. And while she was in our residential shelter program, she engaged in all the various services that we offer specifically within the career development program. And she also partnered with the residential case manager and all the amazing residential counselors that are there to support families on a daily basis. So during her time with us, she enrolled in a training for carpentry and also was hired as an apprentice painter. And during this time, she was also enrolled in ESL classes because of our amazing tutors that we have. And, and really during this time, she was able to save money and then also find housing. So till this date, she's still stably housed for many years now. And her children also have been able to engage in our bridge program through our annual teen college trip. And this is made possible because of our amazing donors and community. And this is really a great opportunity for our teens to get to see colleges, learn about the process, learn about what degrees are out there. And really, it's the first time exposure a lot of times for our teens. So this just comes to show that we're not only supporting our parents, our families, but also the next generation in moving along and ending the cycle of homelessness. Thank you. Always love the stories. They were so wonderful. And Mark, same question. I think really like one of the greatest impacts that we've seen over the last few years, especially during the time of just going through COVID is we as an organization are trying to see really what is our current impact within the space? How can we basically increase our impact to help serve families? And really, as you look towards the next 50 years, the organization really is looking towards developing measures like the Family Stability Program to help really with homelessness prevention and really with the long-term long view goal of working towards poverty prevention. And what does that mean? How can we be a part of that? And really not how are we going to do it alone just as Raphael House, but how are we going to network with our community partners, our local city governments, and our regional governments representatives as well too, to really increase these programs and our impact because the families that we do serve end up living all over the place. Our network isn't just San Francisco. I mean, it's Bay Area and beyond. Really one of my favorite things about working and being a part of Raphael House since I started there was every single time that I bring someone into Raphael House, whether they're a donor, whether they are a volunteer, a community member, or really the first time that I see a family walk through the front door is that what makes Raphael House so unique is it really is a home-like environment. You walk in there, it doesn't feel like a shelter. It feels like a home. The staff treat you with dignity, with respect, like an individual. The culture of the organization among staff, myself, and everybody else is we're all part of serving our families on a daily basis. Whether you're myself, whether you're any member of the staff, we all have an important key part of the mission to achieve on a daily basis. And we're all equally important to making sure that our families are successful. And 
when those families walk through the door and they really feel that sense of support, that sense almost of family in a way, and they see all the different spaces, they have the first family meal where we, we feed them. Our menu changes every night. Our chefs create food with love, as I always say. It's really kind of the heart and soul of the organization. The families can pass the food around to their children. They have their own private space when they're there as well, too, that would never enter unless of health and safety. That's truly their space. And that idea of really, really treating people like an individual and making sure that their needs are met and that we really continue to make sure that Raphael House feels like a home while they're there. And that home will extend beyond, obviously, Raphael House into their new home when they finally get housed and find a place. And we're always going to be there for them if needed. So my favorite memory is looking at the expression when people first walk through the door. I can't wait till we have a chance to have more people come through in the community to see the work that we're doing, to experience Raphael House. And for right now, my joy is seeing the families and they first walk through the door and that support that they feel and that relief that they feel that they finally have a place that for now they can call home until their real next home is achieved. Thank you. It was a really wonderful overview, if you will, of the kind of wraparound services that you deliver and its impact. So Mark, staying with you for folks who are listening to the program Mm -hmm. right now, and that could be someone who wants to perhaps be a volunteer or who wants to make a donation to the 50th anniversary event, for example, or even someone who might be listening to this program that wants to be able to access Raphael House. How can folks get engaged? I mean, the main way you can get gauged, I'd say, is if you go to raphaelhouse.org, which is our main website, we have all the information on our 50th year celebration. We'll be celebrating, by the way, throughout the year, really throughout the next 12 months through our various live events as we can start holding them through our campaigns of celebration, storytelling, and really reaching out to the community to get more people involved. Obviously, our volunteer program is a little limited right now just because of COVID, but there are some ways that our volunteer program is being very creative about getting people involved. Obviously, see things like virtual tutoring and helping us with small fundraisers or helping us actually come to your company. We've done beautiful lunch and learns. We and members of the staff come out, we could do it via Zoom and whatever time works for you, talk about the work that we're doing and really kind of help have a form on you know, homelessness in San Francisco, how we're a part of it and how they can get more involved. And of course, on social media, follow us at Raphael House SF for Raphael House San Francisco. And we have a very active social media community. We'd love um, for you to be a part of that. So we are 100% privately funded organization and community supported as well too. We as an organization currently are looking to continue to increase our donor base, to increase our stakeholders and to increase our impact. And every single donor, whether it's a five dollar, five hundred, fifty thousand, hundred thousand, a million dollar donor, you're all a part of our community and every single dollar counts in our organization. So please reach out to us. We'd love to have you get involved and be a part of the Raphael House family. And then just staying with the idea that you provide workforce training per se, if an employer approached Raphael House and said, okay, I need to fill these positions because what we're hearing now in the media is, oh, I can't find people, et cetera. Can they work with Raphael House in your program to actually train people to specific jobs, for example? Yes. So absolutely. We always like to partner with any agencies, organizations that are looking for any specific people that qualify for their positions. We do like to connect them with our career development manager who does the initial assessment. And then of course, always lets our clients know of any opportunities. So our career development manager has been during this time sending a monthly newsletter. And that's something that has been really great during these times, because that's how we connect with our community. And this newsletter gets out to a lot of our clients who are looking right now for any employment opportunities or any training programs. So really, if there's a need out there, do connect with us. We would love to share any opportunities with our clients. Thank you. And then final question for both of you. I'm going to start with Ceci. Out of the pandemic and, and all of its impact on our community, what do you feel are some of the positive things that could come out of the catastrophe that we've been experiencing for 15 months yes. now? Yes, that's such a great question. I do want to start by sharing that we have such a caring and supportive team. We're just so lucky to have an amazing team to really go through this crisis. I mean, it's been hard for everyone, hard for the community, for our families, our staff, and having the leadership that we have, it's just been really amazing. And 
it's not only me saying this, it's also the team sharing how having the leadership in place, the ED support, the assistant program director, the operations senior manager. I mean, it's just really important that we are up to date with all the health and safety protocols so that we keep the community safe. So that's really been key and critical during this time. In addition, we have also seen the successes of moving our services virtually. So our tutoring moved virtual. So we have been able to provide one-on-one support sessions. And these one-on-one sessions have allowed for more of that focus, right, to be with that student. And this has allowed for one of our high school students to have an A plus and A on her English papers for the first time after working so hard with us for all four years of high school. So she improved her spoken and written communication skills and also shared that her teacher shared her A plus paper as an example with other classes and a teacher's training. So this just comes to show how we just have to be creative and continue to support our families with the services that we have. Thank you. And Mark, same question. So what Ceci just shared is really the reason I think why we get out of bed every single day and are part of this team. It's amazing the impact that we have and don't really realize it until moments like that. And I will say we are nothing without our staff, without our team. You know, our team is truly a group of really passionate professional individuals that are constantly looking to see how we can improve the lives of our family and really see where we can continue to improve our model and how we support our families as well, too. I really think that for us, one of the greatest impact that we've had is that we've really had a chance to bring our programs online, be really efficient on making sure that families don't have to commute into Raphael House, spend the time, resources, and effort to engage in our programs like they did in the past. And they really have access to technology and the resources in their lives to overcome the digital divide. I think that's been a big part of what I'm excited about helping our families currently and also moving ahead, adding more aspects to our support and our outreach to make sure that we can provide that for our families. And it is also us focusing on helping them strengthen their technological skills. I mean, a lot of our families too, something as simple that we take for granted, email, Google Suite, or Microsoft Office, any of those things aren't things that some of our families are typically using, or the children may have been, but the parents haven't been. So it's a way of also focusing our time and resources to see what the technological needs and skill sets are of our families and seeing how we could support them so they're successful really in this new digital online world that probably would have taken another decade to get to this point, but COVID kind of forced us to kind of step into this new brave reality. So I'm happy that we were able to support our families this way. And again, the passion of the staff is continually seeing how we can help our families moving ahead and really make sure that we support their needs, no matter what challenges we're facing moving on. Well, thank you, Ceci and Mark, for sharing Raphael House's work today. We will make sure that listeners have your contact information, website, and social media so they can follow Raphael House and get engaged in your work and to help your mission and hopefully get out there and volunteer and donate whenever possible. Please stay safe and healthy out there as we continue to work our way through this very strange new normal. Thank you, George, for having us. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen to the impact and work that we're doing and you stay safe and healthy as well, too. Thank you, George. We really appreciate you inviting us today. That's it for this episode of Voices of the Community. You've been listening to the voices of the Director of Family Services, Ceci Ferber, and Executive Director, Mark Slater, of Raphael House. During the pandemic, in addition to the very generous private funders Raphael House usually works with, they were able to secure PPP funding to help them stabilize their operations and continue supporting families. To find out more about Raphael House's residential shelter and bridge program, as well as support their children's programs, please go to raphaelhouse.org. After listening to how Raphael House is helping our families stay in housing, we hope that you will get engaged in advocating for our state legislators to both extend the rent moratorium and provide more funding payments to help families to reduce their back rent as well as support other programs. Over the past 14 months of this series, we wanted to bring voices from wonderfully powerful organizations supporting our families, youth, and adults while being unhoused as well as providing the necessary wraparound services to help stabilize them. We hope that you will take the time to listen back to these incredibly insightful interviews with Kevin from Miracle Messages in Episode 1, Denise and Chris from Lava May X in Episode 3, Megan from Simply the Basics in episode 16, Doug from Huckleberry Youth Programs in episode 19, Charles and Demarie 
from At the Crossroads in episode 29, along with our conversation with Liz Lynn of Be Magic and Sakina of Third Street Youth Center and Clinic in episode 51, as well as our conversation with George and Kenneth of Glide in episode 42, and our conversation with one of the oldest family services agency in San Francisco, Edgewood Center for Children and Families, with Justin and Greg Biggs in episode 32. Please tune in to next week's show on June 24th at 8.30 a.m. on KSFP 102.5 FM, where our theme is Housing for Our Artists Community, and we hear from Vital Arts and Northern California Community Land Trust, who share about their work with our artist community to deal with the pandemic's ongoing impact on their housing. We hope that you enjoyed the insights, points of view, and personal stories from the voices of changemakers and their nonprofits and small businesses featured in this series. To find out more and get engaged with the nonprofits, small businesses, and staff members featured in this series, please go to my website, georgecoster.com, and click on Voices of the Community to find links to the extended versions of these interviews and to listen to the entire series. After listening to these stories, we hope that you will consider making a donation and volunteering to provide a hand up to your fellow community members. I want to thank my associate producer, Eric Estrada, and Casey Nance at Citron Studios, along with the wonderful crew at the San Francisco Public Press and KSFP. Voices of the Community is a member of Intersection for the Arts, which allows us to offer you a tax deduction for your contributions. Please go to georgecoster.com and click on the donate link to make a donation to help us provide future shows just like this one. While you're on our website, you can enjoy our archived past shows, which feature community voices working on solutions to critical issues facing Northern California communities. And you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about future shows, as well as shows and events from the organizations that are included in our episodes. Take us along on your next COVID walk by subscribing to Voices of the Community on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at George Coster, and we'd love to hear from you with feedback and show ideas, so send us an email to george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster in San Francisco, and thank you for listening.